from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Meehan, alongside my co-host and partner, Luigi, the Professor, Rosa Bianca. What's going on, Lou? Matt, how are you, pal? We got a real treat for our audience and clients today. Matt, in this interesting economic environment, you know, the gig economy, the hyper-accelerated internet startups... There's one thing that's happening over and over again is classic business models and classic trades are being disrupted. Today, Matt, we have the poster boy of disruption, Mr. Terry Jones, the founding father of Kayak, founding chairman of Travelocity. Terry, welcome to the Liquid Lunch Podcast, my friend. Hey, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for showing up, Terry. So, Terry, I got so many questions, my man. I don't even know where to begin. But let's let's tell the audience a little bit about who you are. But before we jump into, you know, you have five startups, two billion dollar IPOs. You're an author of two books. I mean, you are the American dream, my friend. And I'm so happy to have you on the show. But let's bring everybody back to your childhood, how you grew up, and how you found yourself in the technology space. Well, you know, I, I grew up uh, north of Chicago um, and I went to college in Ohio at Denison University. And when I thought I was going to Vietnam, I got drafted, low draft number, uh, but I got rejected uh, from my back. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no plan, right? Because I thought I was going to war. And one of my college roommates, dad was an airline pilot. So he had a free airline pass. And he said, if I go to grad school, I'm going to lose that. So I'm going to go around the world for a year. And I said, well, I saved up a bunch of money. I'm not going to Vietnam. So I went, three of us went around the world for a year. Great postgraduate education. When I give graduation speeches, I talk to kids all the time. Travel when you get out of college, because you'll never be able to do it the same way again. You'll have a family, a life. Go learn about the world, particularly now. So I came back and I said, I want to get in the travel business. Uh, my dad wasn't thrilled. I had a college education. But... Uh, I went to school at night, learned how to write tickets and do all that stuff and went to work in an agency. And uh, six months in, my manager said, let's go do a startup. So we quit and we formed our own travel agency focused on one of the lines of business that we worked in, which was Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which in the early 70s was actually kind of booming. Nixon and Brezhnev were trying to be friends. So we built this travel agency in five years to the 50th largest in the United States. And we automated it with the very early computing that was available. The airlines were just putting out reservation terminals, and we had a mini computer with a five megabyte disk (laughs) that uh, we used for ticketing. And I got interested in that. And after five years, I kind of said, I want to change what I'm doing. So I jumped to this mini computer company. Uh, And I started in uh, sales, but pretty soon I was doing running product management. And that company was sold to American Airlines. So suddenly I was in a big corporate world. Uh, they asked me to shave my beard. I never did. I still have it 50 years later. <laughs> but, uh, they, uh, so I, I be- eventually became president of that division of American and then uh, was running product management for Sabre, uh, where was the automation arm of American Airlines. We had 40,000 travel agent customers. So I got into product management. And then one day the CIO said, I want you to go run 500 programmers. And I said, I don't know how to do that. And he said, oh, you'll do fine. So suddenly I had 500 mainframe programmers working for me. Um, I did that for three years. And then they said, well, we want you to go run computer operations. And that was 3,000 people, a $300 million budget. I lost my hair uh, trying to keep the computer systems up for 40 airlines, which we ran. Uh, then we decided to spin that out and make our computer division public. Uh, and I became CIO of that company. So Sabre was a public company, uh, got to go to your old stomping ground on wall street and take it public. Um, and 
I was CAO for a while. Didn't really enjoy that job. That was like conducting an orchestra that didn't want to play the same song. <laughs> and uh, one of the products we had was called Easy Saber. It was an online, the very first online booking system. It was on AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe. And we'd had that for, I don't know, six or seven years. And all of a sudden, our big customers, the travel agents, woke up and said, you should turn that off. You're selling bullets to the enemy. Eventually, <laughs> that's going to put us out of business. Well, our chairman, Bob Crandall, said, no, nah, we, we're not going to turn it off, but we'll hide it over in IT with Jones. <laughs> so he gave it to me. <laughs> and I looked at it in 1996. I said, well, why isn't this on the Internet? The internet had just been deregulated. So we put it on the internet and it took off like a weed in the spring. Uh, and after about a year, I went to the CEO and said, I don't want to be CIO anymore. I'm going to go run that thing full time. And so that'll lead us into the story of Travelocity. So that's really how I got it. I'm a history major. I'm not a computing person, but you know, I had a pretty interesting background between marketing and product management being a travel agent and then, you know, running IT, uh, it's a pretty good mix to uh, start an online travel company. What was the learning curve like going from, a, you know, a startup operation to being acquired by American Airlines, right? And moving forward from there. What was the well, learning curve American like was, yeah, that was a great company to work in and, and they, they did a lot of training for people. And, you know, I learned an awful lot that helped me in the startup world because, you know, they were, they were absolutely rabid about budgets and, you know, performance reviews and all the things you do in a big company that you don't do in a startup. And so when we ran travel running Travelocity and my CFO had come from uh, running a large medical company, and then he was CFO at Pan American Airways. Um, you know, we had the kind of discipline of running a large business. So when other people were blowing it all on parties and great offices, you know, we were trying to make money <laughs> and um, which wasn't really fashionable on wall street at the time, making money. You didn't have to make money to have a great stock. Um, maybe still true in some cases, but uh, uh, you know, I think that discipline was, was very useful in, in running the various startups I've had. Terry, let me ask you, um, just going back to your, your backgrounds, your, so you have a really firm background in history and travel. Matt and I have this sort of uh, inside joke where if someone has a lot of initials after his name, we don't want to hire him. Um, tell us a little bit about how important it is to have the life skills and people skills, even more so than it is important to have you know, an MBA or a JD. Well, I, I think it's critically important. And, you know, you have to look for people with that experience. And, of course, in Silicon Valley, we look for people who failed um, because, you know, they've been tested in the fire. Uh, I'll give you an example. My son, when when he was 17, he and, he and nine other guys invented a video game when he was in high school. And by the time he was in college, that game was serving 50,000 people a day. So that was a pretty big game for the time. Uh, and they sold it for 300,000 bucks. And he went to work for Valve uh, for a year and then came back and finished college and went to work for uh, uh, EA, Electronic Arts, biggest game company in the world, right? And after about four years, he quit and did a startup with three other guys. They built a fabulous game. And it's amazing, four guys today can actually build a fabulous game because you you know your IT is in the cloud, your, your customers come from search and social. You can outsource things you can't do, right? And, and that's what's so cool about startups today. You don't need millions of dollars. That company failed. The game was great, but not big enough to be a company. But did he fail? No, he's a senior director on a game company that just sold to Microsoft for $7 billion. So, you know, failure teaches you a lot and experience teaches you a lot. Um, our CTO at Kayak was the best hiring manager I ever met. And he really put together a world-class team and he would go anywhere in the world to hire the best engineer he could find. And at the end of his interview, he would say, who's the smartest person, you know, 
and they say, oh, it's Matthew. And then he go hire Matthew, right? So don't hire your best friend. Hire the best person every time. You know, A players perform way above B players. And that's why Kayak went public with only 200 people, uh, which, you know, 10 years ago was unheard of. Terry, let me ask you one thing. You, you come from an industry um, where years ago, you'd wear a three-piece three piece suit when you go traveling. You know, there was the, the classic liquid lunch, right? No yeah. pun intended. Um, how does one, such as ourselves, starting to get a little bit long in the tooth, prevent from becoming dinosaurs? How do we maintain that cutting edge? Sure. Well, at first I should say that American, we were always required to wear suits when we flew, uh, well past the time when we should have. And, and I asked the chairman of the board, can I wear a sport coat? And he said, as long as you wear matching pants. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> we wore suits forever. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to be curious. And, and one of the things I attribute my good fortune to is, is that I'm a very curious guy. My, my mom made me a reader. My dad was a maker. He was a ham radio operator. And we built radios. And we built go-karts. And we did all kinds of things. And I still read a vast amount in all kinds of industries. Um, and what's fun for me is, you know, I'm a public speaker today and an author. And I, I spoke two weeks ago to the Self Storage Institute, you know, all these guys who run self storage places. And I had to learn about self storage. And then, you know, I spoke uh, to a bunch of guys who, who raise cattle and I was, I was going to talk to him about AI, except I discovered AI in the cattle business is artificial insemination, not artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm constantly learning about other industries. And in fact, when I speak to people, let, let's say I'm going to speak to people in the semiconductor industry, I won't talk about that industry. Because if I suggest something, they'll go, oh, that'll never work. So I usually show them what's happening in a different industry and let them connect the dots. And then they go, oh, well, I could use a drone over here like this. Uh, so, you know, understanding what's happening with disruptive technologies and disruptive business models is key to helping people plan for the future. And in my book, Disruption Off, I talk about 10 technologies, you know, whether it's AI or big data or drones or 3D printing, um, all of those are rapidly changing the way we work. And then... On top of that, we're changing business models. So whoever thought we'd, we'd have subscription raisers, you know, billion dollar companies, right? Uh, what about outcomes? People are selling outcomes instead of, instead of iron. They're saying, you know, instead of just selling you a sensor, I'm going to sell you a system that will detect a failure and dispatch service and knit it all together. So new technologies and new business models are what we have to keep our finger on the pulse of if uh, if we're not going to be the uh, long the tooth person who doesn't understand. You know, Terry, I got a question for you. So you got two books, Innovation On and Disruption Off, right? So in order to disrupt an industry, it has to already exist, right? So Innovation On, are we talking about completing, com uh, excuse me, building completely new industries? That we it's it's in, it's incredibly rare to build something totally new. Almost everything builds on the past. I mean, everybody's excited about Elon, right? Well, cars have been around for 100 years. Rockets have been around for a long time. You know, what he did was totally look at that in a different way. So, you know, I like to say that disruption and innovation are just two sides of the same coin. The only reason you call it a disruption is because you didn't do it. If you <laughs> did, it would be an innovation, but you didn't. And it kind of would bit you in the ass, right? So innovation is the antidote, really, if, if you are being disrupted. But if you want to be a disruptor, you have to look at, well, how can I go after this industry with a different business model, um, with a different price point, with a different technology, and move faster than the embedded guys who are all beholden to Wall Street and they have to make quarterly earnings and you don't. Uh, and you can come bite them in the ankle and, and create a big business. Yeah, you know, one thing that you said is my passion, learning about different companies, different industries, finding out what's going on. I found that 
I fell in love with that when I was on Wall Street, right? I had to learn about different industries and what they were doing. But sure. That connecting the dots factor is something that me and Luigi do every day with our clients. We may have one client that's in healthcare and another client that is in gyms, right? So for example, we try, how can we make them work together so it can benefit the good of both businesses, right? Right. Or take an those, idea are two that could work, those are two that could work very well together, right? Mm -hmm. in, in providing, improving health. Right. I mean, so I, I, I was talking to an insurance company recently and and I had gotten life insurance. And I said to these guys, look, you're the only industry life insurance that actually makes me give blood in order to buy your product. Right. It's pretty awful. Why don't you? But I just went my corporation sent me to have a full physical, you know, all day at a, at a place where they do intensive physicals. How come when I walked out, there wasn't something from you saying, hey, you just had a great blood test. Here's your life insurance. It's pre-approved. Why don't you partner with those guys? Right. And then you don't have to send somebody out to take my blood test. In fact, you can pick the people you want. So you're absolutely right, Matthew. Connecting the dots is, is where new business really can flourish. There's a podcaster named James Alcher, right? And I... I, I his ideas are out there, but I like them. And he calls, he calls that um, idea sex, right? When you bring two ideas <laughs> from different industries and they have sex That's together great. and they, they have this great baby. So I always look for idea sex and synergies between industries and companies that we work with as well. So we got as far yeah, as- Yeah, on the I other know. hand, sometimes two companies or porcupines making love. You know, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> so <that's the> opposite. <laughs> Oh, so we got as far as Travelocity, Terry, right? So they pushed you off in IT. You took Travelocity. They spun it off. You brought that comp company public. How did Kayak come about? Well, let me, you know, one thing I should mention first probably for your, because not everybody on this podcast is an entrepreneur. Travelocity was intrapreneurship, right? I had to build that inside American Airlines and later inside Sabre. And that's kind of different. Right. In, in, in order to be successful. And, and a lot of companies hire me to talk about that because it is so different. And we had to I had to build a team where I brought people in from outside the organization and the organization didn't want me to do that. So to hire from the inside first. But I want to mix it up. I, I made sure I had a separate organization and cut people off, even though I took people from marketing and sales and I.T., I created Travelocity, the, the company inside of American Airlines. I also moved out of the building so that I could create my own culture and I didn't have to wear a suit. And finally, my budget was held by the CEO so that because everybody wanted to, I was losing money and everybody thought, you know, they could do a better job with our money. So my book on innovation really talks partly about the story of Travelocity and how different entrepreneurship is from entrepreneurship. Uh, if you're in a big company, it's very hard to do something new. You get your delivery muscle gets really strong and your delivery, your discovery muscle is pretty weak. Yeah, it's so kind of what happened with Travelocity was eventually the Sabre organization decided they wanted to take that company private. They said Travelocity is too important for our future to leave it as a public company. I was running it for the public shareholders. I wasn't always doing things in their interest. That would have been against the law. I can't do that. I had to run it for the shareholders. So they bought it back. I was sure they would screw it up, so I left. Uh, and they did screw it up. They took a $1.2 billion market cap company and eventually sold it for $200 million. <laughs> So they, they pretty well ruined it. So I left. Uh, I became a public speaker. My brother got me into that. He's a speaker and a National Geographic photographer. And... I was joining boards and I joined a venture capital company, General Catalyst in Boston. And we were looking at travel assets and what, what could we fund, looking at startups. And we had this idea about vertical search for travel. And I was on the board of Overture, which was a very large search company that got sold to Yahoo um, and knew something about search. And we said, yeah, you know, why isn't there a search company? Because only 10% of the people who came to Travelocity actually bought maybe a little less. We said, where the hell did the rest of them go? Well, most of them were, go were using us 
as a directory to find the right flight and the right price. And then they would go to American Airlines to buy because they trusted that brand. So we said, well, why don't we build a company where we search everything, but when you click, you buy direct. And that was the genesis of Kayak. And Joel Cutler at General Catalyst says he would fund it internally, which they didn't normally do, but he wanted to do a startup. And we got found two great guys, uh, Steve Hafner to be CEO uh, and Paul English to be CTO. And I became chairman. Um, and it was a great eight-year ride. Um, we can talk about it in detail if you want. And we ended up uh, going public. And then we sold it to Priceline, now booking.com, for $1.8 billion. So it, it was an idea that nobody else really had at the time. Um, the airlines liked it because they weren't paying a commission. We were a search engine like Google. But we were much more efficient because Google would drop you on the homepage. Because people had already searched on Kayak, we dropped you on the last page. And all you had to do was put in your name and credit card and you were done. So our conversion rate was exponentially higher than customers delivered from Google. Uh, and, and the airlines and hotels liked that a lot. Um, so it, it, was a, it was a great ride, very different than Travelocity. We had no customer service. You know, our computers were in the cloud. We only had 200 people. We were, we were actually, Luigi would like this as a Wall Street guy. We were going to go public on, we only used QuickBooks. And, um, you know, I, I try to remember who took us out, but whoever took us out said, you can't have a pitch that says you're on QuickBooks. You know, you got to have a real accounting system. So we we bought Oracle Financials. I don't know that we ever installed it. It just, you know, the S1 said they have Oracle Financials. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we didn't need it. It was a very simple company. You See, know? but that's exactly the adage that people keep forgetting. Sometimes less is more. You know, we all love the best, the bells and whistles. But when you're running a business, efficiency wins. Yeah. And, and that's what's so great about doing a startup today. You know, like my son's company. I mean, you, you can outsource everything. And you, what are the core things that you're doing that add value? Um, you know, run the business in the cloud. Your, account, your accounting system is in the cloud. Your customer service is probably outsourced. Maybe, you know, six other things are outsourced. But you have the core people who are building the core product. And that's all you need today, along with a great idea. But those core people better be damn good. Terry, you're starting to piss me off. You're like Bo Jackson. Whatever you do, you succeed at. So this is getting ridiculous. So not, not you, start, totally. you, you, you start out and you're old school, you know, three-piece suit. And you do well at that. Um, you're, you're taking businesses public. You do well at that. You're, you're a chairman and you're doing well at that. Then you become a public speaker. And you're knocking that one out of the park. And you, and you write two brilliant books. And audience, if you haven't gotten his books yet, you better get them soon. What's up next for Mr. Jones? Well, you know, let me just say that I don't always hit it out of the park. I, my last startup failed. Um, and and that's, a, that's an instructive story. Um, you obviously didn't have QuickBooks. Yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't even have any revenue, so we didn't need books. But... Uh, I got a call from Ginny Rometty, the chairman of IBM, and she said, would you come up and teach IBM Watson about travel? And that sounded pretty interesting. And I did. And I got to know the GM of Watson. And eventually he decided to leave IBM and do some startups, uh, four startups, actually. And he, one of them, he said, I want to do travel. Would you do it with me? So I did. I became chairman of that company. And we got a, a CEO um, who, who actually didn't work out. I had to get another one. Um, and we were too early. You know, I read later that travel is dead last of all major industries in deploying AI. Um, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have started with it. Um, and we, we had products that did wonderful things, but the travel industry is quite conservative and they, uh, they looked at AI as a risk. And we tried to shift into doing AI for real estate. We got a big investment for real estate company um, and, and we just weren't good partners there. So that business failed. And some of the, re, you know, some of the things in my book, I couldn't do because of my partner. So I failed uh, to learn some of those lessons, but you know, 70% of startups fail. Uh, so 
it's not all success. Um, tomorrow I go to Toronto to look at being on my 20th board, uh, be a new startup. So I've done lots of public companies, uh, but they keep selling. So that's good. I was just Boingo. I was on the board of Boingo. We just sold that. I'm on the two uh, internet security boards. I'm chairman of a large boys and girls camp up in Minnesota. We take we we have about 20% of our kids are, are scholarship kids. So we get kids in the woods. So I don't know. I may write another book. Um, I'm still speaking. Uh, this year, I complete or last year, I, I built a TV studio in my office here in uh, Nevada and went virtual and and realized that if I was going to win at speaking in the new world of Zoom, I had to be better than TV. So I, I built a real studio here. I'm not the little Zoom guy in the corner. I can overlay on my slides. I have crawls. I have interviews. It, it looks like a TV channel because that's the only way to keep people's attention. And I had to learn about all that. Um, so that was really fun. Uh, we'll, we'll see what's next. Maybe another book. Terry, we're not letting you off that easy. Look, guys like us, Matt's, Matt's fire is kindled by his humble beginnings, right? He's got that edge to him that, you know, he, he wants to do, he wants to do well. And he wants to do good. Me, I'm, I'm, I'm a son of immigrant, immigrant parents. So I've got that sort of internal fire. What, what gets you going in the morning? What kindles your fire? Oh, I, something new. You know, to me, I always want to learn about something new. If, if I move the camera over here, you can see a giant stack of magazines and newspapers and pages torn out and, and prints from the web of, of just things people are doing with technology uh, that, that are exciting and interesting. Uh, I want to learn about them and I want to put them in my speech and I'll put them in my next book. Uh, and you know, to me, that's fun. I, I was uh, working with a, I'm an advisor to a start couple mini startups, but I was talking with a guy yesterday and I said, look, the biggest travel trade show is on next week. You, you have to go there. And I said, when you go walk around the edge of the trade show, because the edge is where the new guys are who don't have any money. They can't buy a big booth. First of all, they'll talk to you because you're a little startup too, but you'll learn what's coming. And those are the guys you want to partner with. The guys in the middle with a big booth won't even talk to you anyway. And they're stuck in the past. So I get excited about every, every time I make a speech, whatever the trade show is, you know, it might be oil field gear. I go around the edge of the trade show to learn what's cool. And that gets me excited. Terry, what is the future of travel? How will I book my next trip? Well, I hope they get around to using AI. Um, you know, with, with our company, the, the one that failed, you could use voice and say, I want to go like a business trip. I want to go to London tomorrow after four o'clock on a wide body with an aisle seat and a lie flat bed in business class. You can't do that on any website today. That would take five websites, right? And we made it work. So I hope that changes. Um you know, I think that we're seeing uh, startups are working hard on experiences because particularly millennials want an experience, whether it's, you know, cooking noodles with a one star chef in China or sleeping in a Boma in Botswana. They're not going to the beach and staying in the regular hotel. They want an experience. So that's where travel is going. And, and look, at Airbnb, man, they turned on a dime during COVID and they, they just became profitable, they understood that people didn't want to stay in cities. So they changed their search overnight to push rural destinations because that's what people want. Right now, people want to travel. They want to be outdoors. They don't want to be in a big city because COVID is still raging lots of places. Um, so the, the nimble companies got it. And Airbnb also introduced Airbnb guides to help you have that experience. So that's happening a lot. Um, you know, unfortunately, airlines, uh, since deregulation are, you know, three hours in an aluminum tube with nasty people and no food. Um, it's not really very fun anymore. Um, but, but hotels have gotten to do really exciting things, um, and they're getting more experiential. But I was consulting with a hotel the other day who was very proud of the fact that you could 
book online, check in with your phone, pick your own room. I want to stay in 203, walk past the front desk, and then check out with your phone. I said, that's awesome. Who will ever tell me you have the best restaurant in town? Who will ever tell me that you're, you know, you have a, this fantastic beach program? If you go all digital, that's great, but you better build the digital experience into the phone as well, which they hadn't done. So therefore, it was just like, you know, getting on a bus. There was no relationship between the customer and the hotel. You have to build a digital relationship in the 21st century. And that's one of my speeches, by the way, building digital relationships. I like that. I like that a lot. Hey, Terry, let me ask you something. You know, being in the venture capital space and being on the boards of so many companies and investing and advising all these startups up there, out there, excuse me, there's a lot of startup owners that it may be their first startup and they fail. And some people take that too hard and can't pick themselves back up. Do you have any advice for them? Well, again, you know, I think you need to know it going in. Um, if, if you're in baseball and you're batting 300, you're awesome. Why is that? You get a lot of, you get a lot of at bats, right? But you fail 70% of the time. <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind of sport that is in the Olympics where you get one chance every five years. I mean, startups fail. You have, uh, look, you ever see that guy in Shark Tank who comes in and all the sharks say, well, we like this idea, but you got to pivot this way. And the guy goes, no, I won't change. I don't want your money. And he stalks out. Guy's an idiot. Okay. You got to change. The idea you have going in is not the end point of your company. You know, what did Metternich said? No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Well, no startup survives contact with a customer, right? The customer <laughs> is going to tell you what's wrong and you got to change, even if you're in love with your product. So everybody pivots and a lot of people fail. Uh, and, and maybe you were too early. I, I blew <laughs> millions of dollars on products that are too early um, or didn't work. Customer didn't like them. Uh, we, we put we put travel on maps early in Travelocity to show you because the airfares have nothing to do with mileage. So if you say, how much money do you have? I have 300 bucks. So here's where you can go. We thought it was cool. And it got great press. It was in the New York Times. Nobody used it. It was too early. Customers were still figuring out how to use online travel, right? And it probably cost me a million bucks. It didn't, you know, it didn't pan out. I mean, the publicity was worth a lot. So you got to pick yourself up and say, and, and, and learn from failures. Why do sports teams watch game films? Not to assess blame, but to ensure victory. We don't want to do that again. How, why do we do that? Um, you know, what happened? Was the idea wrong? Was our execution wrong? I mean, obviously, if it's your fifth failure, maybe you ought to do something else. You know, you, maybe it's, maybe it is you. But if it's your first failure, come on, try again. I love that. Hey, Terry, there's been a lot of talk about Facebook changing its name to Meta, the metaverses that are popping up. What are you seeing with travel and the so-called metaverse? There's a wonderful new ad I saw this morning from Iceland. And they... This guy is dressed, you know, just like Mark says, let me introduce you to Iceland verse. It's real. It's here. You can come today. <laughs> you know, it was great. It was like, hey, it's the real world. Um, you know, look, I've seen virtual reality used in uh, senior living facilities to let people who can't travel travel. That's awesome. What a great idea. I've seen augmented reality used in very good ways. In fact, I made a speech earlier this week to the travel industry in Cairo. And we were talking about, let, let me hold up my phone and see what, you know, the temple of Gnosis looked like then, because now it's a pile of rocks. That's very exciting. I mean, that's additive, but you got to go, um, you know, to have the experience. I, I don't think that, you know, we're all going to be like, uh, the characters in the movie Wally that were just flying around on a spaceship eating hamburgers and watching VR. I hope the hell not. And, so, you know, I'm pleased that my son, who's a game designer, uh, you know, is outdoors every weekend. He's not sitting on the couch playing games all the time. So, uh, you know, the metaverse may be fine for certain things. I mean, 
but it takes a long time. We we were terrified back in the in the 90s. I had video conferencing as the CIO at American Airlines at lots of locations. And we said, boy, if this stuff catches on, you know, the airline business is in deep trouble. Well, it never did. Well, guess what happened last year? You know, we're all on Zoom. Everybody's comfortable with video conferencing today, and it is going to hurt. It is hurting air travel. The metaverse has been around for a while. Are we all going to jump into it tomorrow? I don't think so. It's going to take a while, and we'll find a niche for it. And maybe some external event will cause us to spend more time in the metaverse. But I don't think travel needs to be terrified yet. So, Terry, I know the audience is dying to know. Where is your favorite place to travel to? Oh, well, you know, I think uh, one of the most beautiful places in the world that I love to go to is New Zealand. Um, it's just a fabulous country and it has mountains and glaciers, but beaches and great people. And you, you better like lamb, but <laughs> and beer. Uh, but I, I really like to go there. Um, you know, I, I like Japan a lot, particularly rural Japan. I find fascinating. Uh, I've, I've been to France every year for 20 years. Uh, it's just an amazing country. Um, I live in Lake Tahoe, which if you haven't been here is one of the top, I've been to 115 countries, one of the top places to go in the world. Absolutely gorgeous. So, you know, I, I think experiencing other cultures is extremely healthy for people. Um, and, you know, what experiencing the differences, one of the problems in America now that uh, the U S travel industry is complaining about is called generica that we're in generic America. Everything's the same. The restaurants are all the same. The stores are all the same. Why go? That's boring, right? You want to go someplace that's different, that isn't like home, at least I do, uh, and learn about it. So uh, I, I enjoy getting on a plane. I'm going to Spain here in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm excited to be traveling again. Um, you know, travel travel is back. Uh, revenge. My daughter, of all things, became a travel agent. I spent my whole life putting them out of business and she, she was growing, right? <laughs> now that is and, funny, uh, Terry. Yeah. Well, she was an opera singer and, and lost her voice, her singing voice to Lyme disease. She, and she can't sing anymore. But she said, well, I've been all around the world with you. Maybe I can do that. Um, and there's Matt, still I got an idea, Matt. I'm, you and I are going to start a campaign. We want Terry Jones on the Shark Tank. Bye-bye, Mr. Wonderful. Here comes Terry Jones. <laughs> It'd be fun. But anyway, my daughter is swamped right now with business. I mean, her business was absolutely gone, which was fine because she had her first child during during COVID. But now she can't keep up. So travel is back big time. That's great to hear. You know, I, I actually took my family to Lake Tahoe in 2019. It was beautiful. We had a great time. We went in the summer too, not even in the winter. Yeah. We loved it. But we're actually going to Spain in July coming up in 2022. Finally, I'm running with the bulls in Pamplona. So that should be. Oh, 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 well, <laughs> be careful. My wife has done that. I, I, I'm not fast enough, but no. um, but Spain is Spain is doing well. In fact, uh, their vaccination rate is almost 80 percent. So uh, COVID's well under control and uh, tourism is back. So, Terry, we want to be respectful of your time. We really appreciate you. Can you tell everybody where they can find both your books right now? Because I think it's a must read. Sure. Um, right now. The two books, one is called On Innovation and the other one's called Disruption Off. They're both available on Amazon in paperback, uh, in Kindle, and I've narrated both audiobooks are there. So pretty much any format you want. They're very unusual books. Uh, On Innovation is 72 three-page chapters. So it's snackable content, short form media. You can use it as a cookbook. Talks about culture, talks about team, talks about generating ideas, picking the best ideas. How can you become more innovative? Disruption Off is the same short form media format, but the beginning talks about 10 very disruptive technologies from AI to 3D printing. And that's mostly to scare the heck out of you. The second half of the book is what do I do? How do I deal with disruption no matter how it comes at my company? Or how do I use this book as a playbook to become a disruptor? So I think you'll enjoy them both. 
And Terry, how can the audience get in touch with you? I don't know, on any of the socials, you're on Twitter? Sure. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and, and Facebook, but probably the easiest way is my website is tbjones.com. T is in Tom, B is in boy. tbjones.com. There are tons of videos there people can watch of my speeches. Uh, you can buy books um, and, and you can be in contact with me there. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to have a name like Jones. I wanted to get terryjones.com, but that's owned by the Monty Python guy. So <laughs> um, tbjones.com is where they can find me. Everybody go out and get Terry's books. And then if you're having an event, give him a call, call yeah. so you guys can get him set up to speak on your stages. Well, I'd be Terry, happy to do that virtually or physically. Thank you for being here. But I do have one question that we ask every guest on the show before I let you run, right? What does success look like to Mr. Terry Jones? You know, I think success is, to me, was, was creating great companies, but at the same time, creating great teams of people that I'm still friends with, serving, you know, thousands of customers, millions of customers, really, uh, that, that generally were happy with the products we delivered. Um, and success for me is always doing something new. You know, uh, moving on to whether it's becoming a speaker, an author, um, you know, running a charity. And now, you know, I'm busy. I got I have four COVID grandkids, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm off to see them uh, tomorrow um, for the first birthday of a set of twins. So that's another wow. wonderful part of life. So, you know, uh, having a multifaceted life is is fun. And that's what success has been for me is just doing something different all the time. You know what, Terry? I'm giving you a nickname. You are now known as Curious Terry. Yeah, okay, that's <laughs> that's it. All right, guys. Thanks so it. much. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the show. And make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of The Liquid Lunch Project.